This is Intelligence Matters with former acting director of the CIA, Michael Morrell. Brought to you by Lockheed Martin. Your mission is ours. When you really look deep into the region, you see that the demographics of the region distinguishes it unbelievably. You know, 60% of the population of the Arab world are below the age of 13. The 200 million people kind of explode their hearts and minds. It's a story of hope. It's a story of the real issues. It's a story that forces governments to look at this demographic and directs them in terms of the policies that it needs to make. The top finding really that surprised us uh, is, was the finding on migration. The finding that nearly half of young Arabs across these, this vast land want to migrate out of their home countries. Now that is a, is a very shocking, a little over 40%. So we went out there and said, let's find out what these young people in these countries, as well as the rest of the Arab world, feel about protests. And, and, and what we found out is these young people said, yes, we support the protests and we believe protests will bring change. Religion is an important factor that, and it's central to the personal identity of young Arabs, more so than family or even nationality. Most Western uh, media defines, has the stereotype of Arab women being subjugated or not having enough rights. And we asked these people, how do they see in terms of their gender rights And nearly 70% of the young women said, we have equal and in some parts more rights than men. Sunil John runs the Middle East group of Burson, Cohn and Wolf, one of the leading public relations firms in the world. He is the founder of one of the top PR firms in the Middle East and a leader in public opinion polling in the region. Sunil has been the key driver behind the annual Arab Youth Survey which is one of the most widely cited pieces of public opinion research on the region by media and policymakers around the world. I just sat down to talk with Sunil about this year's survey, which provides fascinating insights on Arab youth in the Middle East. We'll be right back with that discussion after a word from our sponsor. I'm Michael Morell, and this is Intelligence Matters. Supercomputing Helicopters. Sikorsky's Raider X and the Sikorsky Boeing Defiant X will operate as nodes in the U.S. Army's hyper-networked battle space of the future. Lockheed Martin, your mission is ours. Sunil, welcome to Intelligence Matters. Thank you for joining us all the way from Dubai. Such a pleasure to talk to you, Michael. Uh, it's indeed uh, uh, a real honor to, to be able to talk to you about uh, what's happening in this region uh, and our wonderful Arab Youth Survey. Sunil, let me start by telling my listeners that I have for a number of years been following the annual survey of Arab youth that you just mentioned, and that while I've always found the survey results to be interesting, I found this year's survey to be especially so. So I asked you, Sunil, whose organization produces the survey to join me on the show here to talk about it. And we're, we're very, very lucky to have you with us. So, Neil, maybe the place to start is let me ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and the different roles that you play. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just very quickly, uh, I, I'm the president f- uh, for the Middle East uh, for uh, BCW, which is Burson Conan Wolf, uh, which is a WPP company headquartered in New York. Uh, it's a top three global PR consultancy. And I'm the president on the global board of the firm, and I cover what is known as the Middle East and North African markets. I originally come from India, but uh, Dubai has been my home for the last 25 years. And, and I've been uh, taking care of this, uh, of my company's uh, uh, business in this region. Uh, as you know, my, uh, Michael, UAE is an amazing country. It's, uh, it's just a population of 10 million people, but there are nearly 200 nationalities that live and work uh, in, this, in this amazing land. Yes. And, and you will you'll be interested to know there are over 
50,000 Americans that live uh, in the UAE as well. Uh, so the city of Dubai, which is an enterprising city, uh, which has no oil, unlike most people think that this is an oil-driven economy, the city of Dubai has no oil, but it has enterprise. And it created that platform for me, uh, who came from all the way from Mumbai in India, to create my own firm, which I started uh, after working in two other firms in the year 2000. So it's been 20 years since I started the firm called Asda, which is an Arabic mm. word, which means echoes. So we echo the messages of our clients in the marketplace. And then in 2008, WPP acquired majority stake in my firm. And from a small firm of six people and one office in Dubai, we were at that time 160 people with eight fully wholly owned offices covering the vast region of the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, uh, and and that's, that's a little bit about me, uh, Michael. Sunil, can you tell us a little bit about the annual youth survey? How did it get started? Why did it get started? What's kept it going for, what, 12 years now? 12 years, exactly. 12 interesting years, because this region's gone through such dramatic upheavals during those 12 years. It was way back in 2008 when we looked at the Arab world uh, as a firm and said, what is it that makes this region so important to the rest of the world? I mean, it's of course important and it's often very important for news channels because of the conflicts that kind of define this region. You know, I don't think the region ever disappoints CNN or BBC by providing information or the updates on conflicts. But there's another nuanced uh, knowledge about the region, which is when you really look deep into the region, you see that the demographics of the region distinguishes it unbelievably, unbelievably. You know, 60% uh, of the population of the Arab world uh, are below the age of 30. You're looking at 200 million young Arabs. That is one of the youngest populations and regions in the world. So when we looked at it way back in 2008, we said, what do governments, private sector, multinational companies know about this large demographic? And and the truth was Mm. very little. This region is so data poor, Michael, you will be surprised. And that's, we said, let's do a thought leadership initiative. Let's go and talk to these young men and women in this age group of 18 to 24 uh, uh, in in about, uh, in the last survey, in the 12th survey, which we did in 2020, we covered 17 Arab countries. And let's talk to them about what they think about their past, their current, and their future. So literally, we went and and, and found out what, what about the young Arabs, the 200 million people, what they uh, kind of explored their hearts and minds. Uh, and what the survey tells you is a completely different story. It's a story of hope. It's a story of the real issues. It's a story that forces governments to look at this demographic and, and, and directs them in terms of the policies that it needs to make. When we started this survey, Michael, you will be surprised. And, and all of this survey, by the way, is uploaded on our website, Arab Youth Survey. Dot com uh, and and it is entirely funded by us so there are we don't take any sponsorship uh, or funds from any government or any organization because we wanted to protect its independence and that's something we have we have actually uh, preserved all these 12 years but when when i was talking about the first surveys 2008 and 2009 and we asked young arabs what is your biggest desire And in 2008 and 9 and 10, in fact, before the Arab Spring, the number one desire the young people had was to live in a democracy. It's all there. The data is all Mm. there. And if anybody looked at this survey at that time, and by the way, in the beginning years, nobody took our survey seriously. Neither the regional governments nor uh, countries across uh, the world. But if anybody was looking at those findings, they could see the Arab Spring happening. That is the brilliance mm. of data. Yeah. And when, when it happened in mm. 2011, we had a special briefing for all of the Arab ambassadors in Washington, D.C. And our firm actually did a private in-camera briefing. The room was full, Michael. 
because everybody wanted to know mm. what are these young people saying? How does it impact the government? Because that was an epochal change. There were there were you know uh, uh, there were leaders that were that that had fallen. Whether it's Hosni Mubarak, Muammar Gaddafi, President Saleh, or, or any of the other leaders that changed mm-hmm. because of the protests. And that's the value of the Arab Youth Survey that we bring every year. And 2020 was no exception with findings that have been dramatic. So Sunil, in terms of the latest survey, can you give us the details? You said 18 to 24, 17 countries. What is that? What does those 17 countries encompass geographically? Um, How many folks were surveyed um, and over what period of time? Sure. Uh, So first of all, 17 countries is is a a vast number of countries, but we actually break them down into three very distinct regions. So you have the oil-driven economies of the Gulf. So you have Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, and Oman. So those are very distinct. They are, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, economies that are large in size and there is much more wealth in these countries. Then you have the conflict-ridden, what are called Levantine countries of Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, uh, Syria, and the Palestinian Authority. So that's another group of countries that we put together. Mm-hmm. And then you have the populous North African countries of Egypt, uh, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Again, some parts of it as well uh, have serious amount of conflict. So we actually distinguished the findings in these in these three distinct regions, though all part of the Arab world. Uh, we go and talk to uh, to uh, this year in 2020. We did the survey in two parts. Remember, uh, Michael, this was a pandemic year, uh, and every year we go out into the field right. in the months of Jan, Feb, and March. And at that time, we spoke to uh, 3,400 young Arabs in, in that age group, all face-to-face interviews. These are not online interviews. Mm. And that gives it so much more dependence in terms of what to so be capture that. And these surveys are done by our sister firm, PSB, which is, as you know, the polling firm based out of New York, which is famous for all the polling work they've done for President Clinton and Tony Blair and, and of course, for Prime Minister Modi in, 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 uh, in, in India as well. So they actually conduct the polling and then we work with them to analyze the results. So, so however, after we did the first phase of the polling and we saw the results, the pandemic suddenly broke through. Uh, in the region until March, it hadn't really affected the region. And we said, you know, we can't come out with the finding until we do a bit of a, you know, kind of a post-COVID or, or during COVID survey to see if there ha- if perceptions have changed. So we went back into the field and did 600 interviews in about in six countries. So the survey uh, this year has captured about 4,000 interviews with young people, as you said, in the age group 18 to 24, 50% male, 50% female. Uh, and those are the results that we came out with uh, in October. So it took us a little time last year, but we, we spent a little more time to make sure that the findings are, are kind of recalibrated and retested to make sure that those findings reflect the facts on the ground. In fact, we were the first survey to go into the Arab world to look at the impact of COVID on young people and some some interesting findings there. So Sunil, walk us through what you consider to be the top findings, the most interesting findings of the latest survey. I think this year, Michael, that was the top finding really that surprised us uh, is was the finding of on migration. The finding that nearly half of young Arabs across these, this vast land want to migrate out of their home countries. Now, that is a, is a very shocking, a little over 40%. When you have your young population having lost hope in their, in their, in their countries and want to migrate, that is a huge red flag for governments, not only for governments in the region, but a huge red flag for, for the foreign countries where these people want to go. The pressure on the border mm-hmm. in Europe is fairly well known. And how did that finding happen? Because we there are three things connected with this. In 2019, if you remember, Michael, there were a huge number of protests in countries such as Lebanon, Algeria, Sudan, and Iraq. And, and these were young Arabs yes. going onto the streets and protesting against the lack of opportunities and youth uh, having not enough 
uh, employment. As you know, the Arab world has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. As per World Bank, nearly 30%. And that created a huge amount of anxiety and pressure Then the economies had, had its own pressures. Youth went there and they actually, it resulted in changing leadership in all of these four countries. So we went out there and said, let's find out what these young people in these countries, as well as the rest of the Arab world, feel about protests. And, and, and what we found out is these young people said, yes, we support the protests and we believe protests will bring change. It was almost described as Arab Spring 2.0, you know, almost a, a new version of that. But the real reason why these young people went onto the streets was because they were frustrated with government corruption and corruption that stopped opportunity reaching these young people. And when there is this pressure mm -hmm. of no jobs no, and, and, and increasing government corruption, what do young people uh, you know, do? And that's where the finding of migration really, really surprised us. But, you know, that's kind of, And is that... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask if that, if that finding is consistent across the three groups of countries that you talked about earlier. Oh, uh, that is uh, very much uh, in, in the uh, North African and Levantine countries, as, as we know. I mean, the, the highest amount of propensity to emigrate is in Lebanon, nearly 77% of all Lebanese youth mm. wanted to emigrate. Libya, 69%. Yemen, 66%. Iraq, mm. 65%. Those are the top four countries where people want to emigrate. And not surprising, Michael, because those are the, 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 the countries with the highest amount of conflict and pressure on the economies. But yes, right. yes Palestine, right. Jordan, Syria, Sudan, all of those are over 50%. Uh, and, and so, but however, the lowest, I mean, in the UAE, for example, just under 3% of the people want to emigrate. In Saudi Arabia, just 6%. Oman, about 12 So similarly, so the Gulf cont uh, countries do not have the pressure of immigration. It's more in the conflict-ridden countries of North America, North, North Africa, as well as the Gulf. Gotcha. So what else in terms of, of key findings? I think the, the, the second finding that, uh, that really uh, was important, and especially uh, for your audience to know is that what defines young people and their personal identity. And what we found, and this is consistent over the last two years, is that religion is an important factor that, and it's central to the personal identity of young Arabs, more so than family or even nationality. But these young people, when we further probed on the subject, we found that while religion is important for their personal identity, they do not wish religion to play a big role in society. They want a diminished role for religion in, in public. And they want religious institutions to reform. And that is, in many ways, a nuanced finding of how young people see the future. Because religion dominates society for decades together. And here is a young right. cohort of young people who are saying, yes, you know, religion defines me, but I want a, 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 a public society where, you know, where one looks at proper governance, one looks at uh, efficiency, looks at great policy, and addresses the key issues of good quality education and jobs. That is a quite surprising finding. And I think that's a positive finding in terms of how young people have a modern outlook towards their future. Another finding which I think, if, if you allow me, is about gender rights or gender opportunity. And here is a surprising one because, you know, most Western uh, media defines, has the stereotype of Arab women being subjugated or not having enough rights. But when we yes. went and spoke to these young, as you know, the sample is 50% female, and we asked these people, how do they see in terms of their gender rights and nearly 70% of the young women said, we have equal and in some parts more rights than men, than their men folk. And they have equal access to good quality education and jobs. That's, that really surprised us this year in terms of how young women uh, are, are looking at their future, that they are. So you see some of the government policies 
coming to actual impact on the ground where young young women are seeing more opportunity for themselves they're getting into the workforce and and we see that as a as a big uh, uh, as a big positive in the findings as well we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor then we'll be right back with more of a discussion with Sunil John The U.S. Army will modernize its entire helicopter fleet as it transforms into a multi-domain force. Sikorsky's Raider X and the Sikorsky Boeing Defiant X are here for that challenge. These integrated weapon systems are the only ones flying today that are powered by X2 technology to operate as nodes in the Army's hyper-networked battle space of the future. Designed with a unique understanding of the mission, they'll give the Army the edge and they represent the choice between simply keeping up with technology or outpacing it. Sunil, on the gender question, does that differ sharply by the three groups of countries you talked about? Actually, surprisingly not. Uh, uh, when you look at uh, both uh, the Gulf, uh, the Levantine countries, as well as uh, North Africa, you see uh, uh, young uh, women seeing uh, equal opportunity across across all the marks. And this is one of the one of the best findings yeah, if you look at it you know 71% in the in the gulf the young women in the gulf felt that they have uh, equal opportunity another 62% in north africa and another 60% in levant so clearly i think uh, uh, that that is one finding that is consistent across the three groups of countries sunil are there any other key findings you want to highlight you know, I, I'm sure you're, you're interested in this, uh, Michael, which is on foreign uh, affairs. And I think the three, uh, the young, we, we, or every year we ask them, you know, who, which countries uh, do young people look at in terms of uh, enemies and uh, and 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 allies? Uh, and right. and and this is quite a dramatic change because, from as you know, historically, you know, the 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 center of power has always been. Uh, you know the, the Cairo and Damascus and the Baghdad in in many ways, uh, but that has changed because the the three rising powers, according to Arab youth, uh, and that's both the Arab and the non-Arab countries. The first one is Saudi Arabia, then comes UAE, and the third is the United States of America. The U.S. is seen among KSA and Saudi Arabia and UAE as the three rising powers, and there is some very nuanced findings of how young people see the United States as an important. Uh, ally in their future, and we could probably discuss that even more, uh, especially with regards to how uh, how things have changed, especially with what I call the Trump effect uh, and, and its impact on the region, and how young people see the United States through the lens of foreign policy, and how they very intel- intelligently look at the United States through what's called the soft power lens, through the view in through Hollywood and mm. Netflix. You see very distinguished views of these young people on how they see the US. And that's such an interesting finding and which I'd like to talk to you more about. So can so can you talk a little bit more about that? Can you talk about this so-called Trump effect? You know, when we, when we looked at uh, uh, how the US, how Arab youth see the US as an ally, uh, there was a big positive. Nearly 63% of the young people saw U.S. as a favorable ally in the year 2016. That was the last year of the Obama administration. And then came Trump and in 20 and the and the Muslim ban and a lot of the policies that happened. That 63% dropped to nearly 35. It was the lowest point in the 12 years that we have seen in terms of how the Arab the, the view from the street, actually, from uh, uh, of how Arab youth see the U.S. And that is what, you know, the drop from 63 to 35 in 2018 is what we call the Trump effect. However, over the last two years, it's been picking up. In 2020, uh, uh, young people, young Arabs look at the U.S., 56% of them look at uh, the U.S. as an ally. So there's been a move up. And I think it's, it's uh, I think a lot of young people are looking at the Biden administration uh, to look at the, the region differently. Uh, and I, th- I think there's a lot of hope that, uh, that the U.S. will play a much more engaging role uh, in the region because that's the aspiration of young people. Uh, but, and, you know, and, y- yes, go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. I was saying that, you know, but this, when we asked the same young people who saw 
uh, who looked at the U.S. in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the ally and adversary role. At the same time, we asked the question, which is the country they see as a model nation, a, a, a nation that their own country should emulate? Of course, the, the first nation there is the United Arab Emirates. The UAE is seen as a model nation. It's almost a city on the hill. But the second most popular country is the U.S., so when you look at it, that is, there is an aspiration value of brand United States in the minds of young people. They see and they understand the values of what U.S. stands for. And there is this huge thirst to know more about the country, to, to understand, to, to, uh, to, to know the American way of life as a land of opportunity. And they want their own country to emulate what the U.S. done. The second most favorite country of Arab youth after the, United, the UAE is the U.S. and I think that is that is quite a, you know I I look at this cohort of young people you know as a very intelligent uh, uh, set of people who understand and nuance their perceptions by what they see and, and that is a, a, is quite an interesting finding. How did they think about China in that allies enemies context? Uh, so so this is something we've been we've been looking at as you know for several years uh, and in terms of foreign policy uh, it's been going up and down and and to just give you i'm just picking up the 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 uh, the actual numbers on that china has uh, russia uh, turkey uh, have all emerged as as powers that are hungry to replace uh, to replace U.S., especially after their disengagement policy. And I think uh, uh, that's something that the United States need to look at very, very closely. So when you look at it, uh, China is seen by 73% as an ally. Russia is seen by at 71% as an ally. Turkey by 61%. And then comes the United States at 56%. So as you can mm. see, there is a vacuum that has been created especially with the disengagement policy over the last mm. several years. And that has created uh, 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 the opportunity for several of these countries, especially China, Russia, Turkey, uh, and Iran as well, to be able to play a role. Iran has very strong relationship with certain parts, especially in the Levant and in Yemen as well. So you can see that it's a very dynamic situation. But however, I think, you know, as I said, more and more the Arab world is turning to its own in terms of its allies. So if you look at its two biggest allies are, you know, the, the Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And that's where the center of foreign policy power is today. Uh, and, and that has dramatically changed from, you know, five, six, 10 years ago. What's attractive about the UAE as a governance model to these young people? Oh, we asked them, why do they choose uh, the UAE as a model nation? And uh, there are four reasons that they have picked up. Uh, and, and those are, uh, you know, safe and secure. And these, this is, I mean, the region, especially the conflict zone, has been very unstable. And within that, you know, the UAE has been a very peaceful zone, almost, uh, you know, a, a safe zone for a lot of people. Safety and security, wide range of work opportunities. Of course, general salary packages, as you know, in the UAE, there's tax-free salaries, Michael, you know that. Uh, yeah, I could use that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and, and a growing economy. So those are the four reasons why they chose the UAE as a, as a model nation, as, as a place where they'd like to live and they want their own, con own countries to emulate. And I think uh, that uh, that has been consistent over the last nine years ever since we introduced the question in 2012 uh, and the u.s has remained the second choice over the last six years michael so you know so there is that aspirational value of the u.s as well that that holds a great amount of traction in the minds of young young, young arabs yeah so sunil when i look at the totality of the findings the single word that jumps out to me is pragmatism can you just react to that absolutely uh, i think when you when as i said earlier uh, michael that when we asked young people in the early years of the survey in 2008 uh, 9 and 10 what is their biggest desire and they said that their biggest desire is to live in a democracy 
And then came the Arab Spring in 2011. And there's, there was this huge euphoria of the revolution, that as we call the Tahrir Square uh, generation. And then uh, over the years, about five, six years ago, uh, the, that, that kind of ebbed with, uh, with the change not happening up to their expectation. So almost these young people uh, uh, almost kind of focused on the here and now. They, uh, the young people became more practical with what they have to do with their lives. They were focused on getting a good education. They were focused on getting jobs. And those job choices have changed dramatically over the last five, six years. So you see a very pragmatic, intelligent group of people that, that, uh, uh, that say, uh, for example, you know, we asked, uh, uh, you know, 90 percent, as I said, in 2008, looked at democracy as very important. But in, in 2020, we asked them, 51% of these same young people, the Arabs, Arab youth, said that democracy as defined by the Western world will never work in the Middle East. So, you know, they are becoming more practical. You know, they are focusing on the main issues of what mm -hmm. governments should be focused on, which is about having good quality governance, to be able to create great quality education so that the young people are ready for the jobs of the future. They feel they missed out. And of course, to be able to create the right kind of jobs. And if you look at it, uh, Michael, you know, the, uh, when we looked at it 12 years ago, the majority of the uh, of jobs were coming in the government sector. The government mm. was providing all that the young people needed and young people preferred to work in a cushy government job, but government is maxed out. How many more jobs can they create? So, you know, I, I think m m more of the government policies is to encourage the private sector to create more jobs. And now there is a whole new movement towards, you know, focusing on young people starting their own businesses. So the spirit of entrepreneurism has really emerged over the last four or five years. You can see centers of technology. There are these big unicorns, you know, brands like Kareem that, that Uber has taken over, a brand like Souk.com that Amazon has taken over. These are all unicorns that have come and emerged from this region. There are, there, you know, there is a, a Dubai startup called Stars Play, which is a streaming video on demand service. Uh, which operates across the MENA markets, and they are bigger than Netflix, you see, because they have, mm. uh, you know, and you have another music streaming service called Angami, which is bigger than Spotify and Deezer. So, so there's a lot of technology startups, and there's this whole new movement of young people looking at creating their own companies and, and looking at private sector jobs. So things have changed dramatically, yet, you know, the region needs to create 100 million new jobs. And the problem is that there are more young people coming into the workforce and the pressure is not stopping. It's becoming even bigger and the government has to do more. You know, how, whatever, whatever you say about the Arab Spring, that particular movement, it's the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, actually, in, 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 20, in 2021. Uh, uh, that movement has dramatically changed how government sees how they run. They started speaking to their citizens. They started looking at more policy. And you have this whole new movement of the sovereign wealth funds, especially in the Gulf, focused on domestic investments, on focused on creating jobs, on encouraging the SME movement, the small and medium enterprise uh, sector. They're looking at, so in a, from a, a pivoting from an international investment policy to actually focusing on more domestic uh, industry, on making more, uh, making the economies more diversified. You know, the governments are are, are very uh, uh, clear about how climate change is going to make sure that you know hydrocarbon focused economies do not have much of a future in the next 20, 30 years, and they need to pivot to an economy that is decarbonized, that is much more in a net zero environment that we'll be going into, and that's where governments are pivoting to new policies diversifying their economies, focused on infrastructure, and creating more jobs for young people. So Sunil, I take it from everything you said and from the tone of your voice and actually the excitement in your voice that these results make you hopeful for the future of the region. Absolutely. Uh, there are a couple of things that, uh, that define that view, uh, Michael, uh, and if you may. Uh, one is, of course, 
uh, uh, you're such a keen observer of the region. You know this region. And I've read your books and you understand this. But the big conflict zones, and there are four of them, you know, Syria, Libya, Iraq, and Yemen. And when you look at what's happening in those four conflict zones, there are many of, this, many of the actors in that, including the foreign powers, they are veering towards coming to the table for talks to be able to de-escalate those conflicts. Uh, the, the huge dynamic of the Abraham Accord uh, uh, that, the, that the UAE and Bahrain signed with Israel and the United yes. States has changed the entire dynamic of foreign policy in this region. And I have no doubt, and I think, uh, uh, you know, the new Secretary of State Blinken actually in his, uh, in his presentation to the Senate did actually say that that policy uh, would continue uh, uh, besides, of course, looking at the two-state policy uh, uh, with the focus on Palestine as well. But the Abraham Accord has de-escalated a lot of the old conflicts and, you know, me living in Dubai and the UAE, you can see how things have changed so fast and so dramatically. You see Israeli business now investing here. So many kosher restaurants opening in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. You're seeing a, a whole set of tourists coming in. Uh, of course, with the, the recent uh, rise in conflict uh, in, in the COVID cases, there's been a little bit of a lull. But I can see huge amount of energy here. And with more and more countries getting into their there is a new dynamic in foreign policy. And I think that is a big positive development. Uh, uh, besides that, of course, you know, more young people are, uh, are, are seeing the world not through uh, the eyes of uh, uh, government or state-driven media, but they are seeing the world through social media. The social mm. media revolution has provided a view to these young people which has dramatically changed their view of what they need and what they want. And the government, and it puts tremendous amount of pressure for governments to perform because they see what's happening across the world. Their ambitions and their aspirations have grown dramatically. And the pressure on government to deliver is unbelievably huge. And that's why all of these things are, are changing. In fact, some of the, you'll be surprised, Michael, you know, Twitter and Snapchat, for example, have some of their highest per capita usage here in the region, especially in, in, in countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE and other countries. So, so the social media has, is a big factor. I think uh, government corruption, as our findings said, is a, is a massive factor that the young people want the governments to tackle. They want, and when they say that, all they're asking for is more opportunity. Uh, and that's as simple as it is, you know. I think governments need to fix that problem. Uh, and that's what they're focused on. And of course, I you know, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, Sunil, I think that what this means for the United States is extraordinarily important. And it has to start with a better understanding of the region because most Americans, and, and quite frankly, even many policymakers, think of the region in terms of the conflict zones, right? And what you're saying is there's so much more going on here and much of it positive. And if other nations, including the United States, don't see that, if they miss it, they're going to miss a huge opportunity. Totally agree, Michael. I think it's, uh, it, you know, the young people and the region look at the United States as an important ally. There's been traditional links. I think the policy uh, of disengagement has not played well uh, for the United States. It is, this is an important part of the world. You know, the Arab world, as you know, Michael, is 400 million people across these 22 nations. Uh, yes, it's known for its conflicts, but now, as you know, it's known for its young, young, young people. But also, it's a region where three of the biggest religions in the world were born. You know, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism was born in this region. There is vast amount of history here, uh, and 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 the young people are dramatically changing this region. The U.S. has it. It has an important uh, objective to be able to look at this region with a different lens to be able to build its uh, its lasting links based on its soft power on its ability to inspire young people you know as to be able to to understand american values and i think that's where 
there is a huge opportunity which the United States should never miss. Yeah. Sunil, one more time, how can people find the survey? Uh, all you have to do is log on to arabyouthsurvey.com and you'll find all of the findings from 2008 to 2020. 12 white great. papers, great readings with expert commentary as well. So uh, do spend some time and it's, uh, and, and, uh, it's, it's uh, a lot of effort that our firm uh, BCW and PSB does or to bring that survey in a very, very independent fashion uh, to be able to make sure that you get credible and, and scientific results of a huge demographic in the Arab world. Sunil, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I know it's late there, but I really do appreciate you sharing all of this with us. Thank you. Such a pleasure, Michael, and have a great day. That was Sunil John. I'm Michael Morell. Please join us next week for another episode of Intelligence Matters. Intelligence Matters is sponsored by Lockheed Martin. Your mission is ours. This show is produced by Olivia Gassis, Jamie Benson, Jake Rosen, Paulina Smolinski, and Ariana Freeman. For more from this week's show, visit cbsnews.com. Intelligence Matters is a production of CBS Audio. Like most people, Pod Save America co-host Tommy Vitor thought foreign policy was boring and complicated until he got the education of a lifetime working for President Obama's National Security Council. It was a crash course that taught him two things. Anyone can understand these issues, and we all have an obligation to try. That's why he started Pod Save the World, a weekly podcast from Crooked Media that breaks down international news and foreign policy developments, but doesn't feel like homework. Each week, he and former Deputy National Security Advisor and co-host Ben Rhodes walk you through the latest developments with a variety of experts while sharing behind-the-scenes stories along the way. I worked with both Tommy and Ben at the White House for President Obama, and they know what they're talking about. New episodes of Pod Save the World drop every Wednesday. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. (laughs) 